Hi everyone. Welcome to Kate Bonnie Country. I'm Kate Bonnie. Thank you so much for stopping by. Today I want to talk a little bit about a piece of video, some police body cam footage that crossed my news feed. You see, this 13 year old girl ran to a neighbor for help because her father was about to start stabbing her mother. By the time the police got there, the father had stabbed the mother multiple times. I'm not here to debate about the use of deadly force within police departments. I want to talk about how this situation would be handled in a rural area. In order to keep it YouTube acceptable, I have removed the original audio and blurred out the portions of the film where you would see a lot of blood or the victim's identities. But I still have to warn you, this may be disturbing for some viewers. In editing, I will put up the chapter mark where you can skip forward if you want to skip that part of the film. Once again, viewer discretion is advised. So come on in, take a seat, and let's get rolling. That was just horrible. I cannot imagine how that poor girl felt. I first saw this video posted by a user called Alex on the Newsbreak app. There was no context as to where or when this happened, so I had to search the internet to get some answers. It turns out that this occurred in Stockton, California, and was reported on by CBS 13 out of Sacramento. This is clearly an urban area. A cursory internet search revealed a document from 2008 which stated the Stockton Police Department has a three to five minute response time for life threatening emergencies. Unfortunately, I was not able to find any more recent data without spending hours and hours diving into documents. So for the sake of this discussion, we will say that the police responded within five minutes. According to CBS 13 Sacramento, in a report dated March 19, 2024, this incident occurred on February 3rd of 2024. Five children were in the home at the time of this attack. None were injured. The mother suffered multiple stab wounds. She was hospitalized and released home to continue her recovery. Officers rendered aid to the assailant once he was no longer a threat to himself or others. He was transported to a local hospital, treated, and then charged. However, what he was charged with is not listed. No officers were injured, and thankfully, there were no fatalities. Of course, the comment section on this post was full of opposing viewpoints. 
the vast majority stated that they believed this was justified use of deadly force. However, there were several who suggested that perhaps a taser should have been deployed first. I don't really want to debate that today. Hi, Tay. Come up. Hi, Tamir. You coming up? Oh, hi. Hello, Tamir. <laughs> hi. Instead, I want to pose a hypothetical situation where this happens in a rural area where emergency response times are significantly longer. Forgive Tamir in the background. She's being noisy today. So I spent about a half hour searching online to try to find out what the response times are to my area. And I was not able to find that data very easily. But I do know people in law enforcement in the area. So I gave my friend a call. As it turns out, I live in an area whose primary responsibility is assigned to the county. I live outside of the police jurisdiction of the closest town. So in the event of a life-threatening emergency, if county was to respond, it would take a minimum of 20 minutes for them to get to my property. Wow, a lot can happen in 20 minutes. However, I do live about three miles outside of the police jurisdiction of the closest town. In life-threatening emergencies, an officer from that town would be dispatched to assist. Well, that's something. So how long is it going to take somebody to get here? The response was, it will still take 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes for help to arrive in a life-threatening emergency. Back in the early 1990s, I trained as an emergency medical technician. And the one thing they drilled into our heads is that response time is essential to saving lives. Get there as quickly and safely as possible. Oh, heck with this. I'm going to try. I, the, the, the reflection, the reflection in my glasses is driving me crazy, so I'm going to try to do this without my glasses while reading a script. Now, during my EMT training, I learned that it takes about seven minutes for a patient to exsanguinate or bleed out from a severed femoral artery. The femoral artery is the main artery that supplies blood to your legs. And if the brachial artery in the armpit is severed, it can take about three minutes to exsanguinate. So if one of my neighbors or myself was attacked in this manner, we're kind of on our own. When you live in a rural area, you are on your own. You have to manage the situation until help arrives. And that's if you can even call for help. My property sits right on the service line between a 5G cell tower and a 4G cell tower. Sometimes I have a very strong 5G signal. Sometimes I have a moderate 4G signal. And sometimes I don't have a signal at all. With the majority of people moving towards cellular service, it's harder and harder to find a neighbor with a landline. Sometimes it's going to be faster to patch a patient up, shove them in your car, and take them to the hospital yourself. 
The closest neighbor to me with children lives about a quarter mile away. So what would it look like if their daughter came running to my front door looking for help? It would take at least 20 minutes for an ambulance to get to their house. In the meantime, it is on me to try to save that woman's life. I imagine it would go something like this. The girl would arrive at my door. It would take me a few seconds to figure out what she's trying to tell me. Once I was able to figure out what was going on, I would dial 911 and hand her my phone. I would let her give the information to dispatch. And then I would grab my IFAC, which stands for Infantry First Aid Kid, and my rifle, jump in my car, and get to her house. I would leave her here because she doesn't need to see her mama bleeding to death. So I get over there and I hear the woman screaming. And I'm going to advance on the door with my rifle at the ready. And I'm pretty much going to do what this officer did. As soon as that lady has the door open, I have to assess the situation and figure out what to do next. Of course, I'm going to try to convince him to drop the knife and move away from her. I don't want to to shoot him, but it might become necessary. He was shot when he left her side and reached for something behind the door. It is entirely possible he was retrieving that knife. He could be intending to advance on me at that point. I have no choice. I will have to discharge the weapon. So the next question is, have I committed a crime? I had the forethought to grab my rifle. It could be argued that my shooting him is a premeditated act. Luckily, I live in the state of Alabama, where we have a stand your ground law that was passed in 2006. This law allows me to defend myself and others in any place that I have a right to be. This includes my home, the homes of my families and friends, my vehicle, any store I'm shopping at, or any place that I have lawful right to be. As long as I'm not there intending to commit another crime, I can act in defense of myself and others. So what I do next will determine if this was a lawful act to understand your ground, or if I'm going to face murder charges or attempted murder. I am not a lawyer. This is 100% my layman's understanding of the law. So I cannot say for certain if what I am about to hypothesize would be correct. So remember, before running to the neighbor's house, I grabbed my IFAC and I grabbed my rifle. And if I happened to be filming something when she showed up, I might even have my own body camera on in the form of my action camera on my chest rig. So by grabbing the IFAC, I show intent of rendering aid to the victim. That makes it very easy for me to argue that I grabbed my rifle to defend myself if necessary. Now, if I'd only grabbed my rifle, it could be argued that I went over there with malicious intent to cause injury or unalive the assailant. I would be arrested, I would be charged, and a jury of my peers would determine my fate. If you are ever in a situation where you must use deadly force, it is absolutely necessary for you to render aid once the threat is neutralized. If you continue to attack after the threat is neutralized, you just cross the line from self-defense into a felony. So now I have two people that require aid. So what do I do next? Well, first and foremost, I want to make sure he can no longer reach a weapon. So I'm going to 
very carefully while staying trained on him, I'm going to kick his weapon as far away as possible and hopefully not give him an opportunity to grab me. Hopefully, he's got sense enough to realize he has been hit and he needs to be very, very still right now. Then, I'm going to keep my eyes on him. I'm going to grab her by her collar, her underarm, whatever I can do with my free hand, and I am going to drag her backwards, away from him. I want to put some distance between them. Heck, I came here in my car. I might try to drag her to the other side of my vehicle so there is a little bit of concealment and cover between the two of them. But I also need to be able to keep my eye on him. In the video, it took roughly 50, five zero seconds for the officer to render the threat neutralized. So let's say I dialed 911. It probably took me two minutes, possibly three, to gather my things, get in my car, and drive that quarter mile. So it has been four to five minutes since that 911 call was made. I still have five to ten minutes before the police will arrive. Five to ten minutes. If he's still ranting and raving, I'm getting her in the car, I'm driving back to my house, and I'm waiting for the police. If he is unconscious and he is no longer combative, I am going to treat her injuries right there. I'm going to bind her dressings and I'm going to stop her bleeding. Then, once I've done everything I can do for her, I'm going to have her talk to me the entire time while I go check on him. If he is unconscious, I now have a duty to render aid to him as well. If he's conscious, I'll throw him some bandages and tell him to wrap himself up and focus back on her. If he is unconscious, I'm going to try to save his life too because that is what a good person does. That is what someone with no malicious intent does. You must render aid once the threat is neutralized. So hopefully by the time I've dressed their wounds to the best of my ability, I'm starting to hear sirens in the distance. Um, I still have a rifle on me. I should probably put that down a good distance from him and a good distance from me because the last thing I want is for law enforcement to roll up on the scene and mistaking me for a threat. So I'm going to make sure that my weapon is out of his reach and a safe distance from me. Once law enforcement and the ambulance arrives, well, I no longer have a duty to care. My duty to render aid is over. Of course, I have to stay on the scene. I have not been released from the scene because, let's face it, I am one heck of a witness. But I also need to be very careful what I say, what I admit to, what I do not admit to. Naturally, I'm going to give law enforcement pertinent information that will assist in saving their lives. But I'm not going to say anything else until I have an attorney present. Whether you have been Mirandized or not, any statement you give to law enforcement can be used in a court of law. I will naturally surrender my weapon. If I have a body cam on, I'm going to surrender that body cam because those are part of the evidence. I have no right to remove those from the scene. But I'm also not going to answer a single question until I have my attorney present. We need to remember that in a situation like this, the police's job is to collect evidence and assess if there is a need to make an arrest at this time. If that officer feels the need to put me under arrest, he absolutely will. And I'm not going to blame the man for doing his job. 
Chances are the local DA would not file charges against me and would cite the stand your ground law as justification for my actions. But that might not always be the case. I sincerely hope I never face this situation. I sincerely hope none of my viewers are faced with a similar situation. But if that does happen, well, my thoughts are, I hope I'm a good person. I hope I did the right thing, even if that right thing lands me in jail for a little while. So what do you think? Would you do something differently? Would you stay at home with the girl in safety, knowing that her mother could be dead by the time help arrives? Would you be prepared to intervene and render aid if necessary? Would you take an item with you to defend yourself with? Would you take pepper spray? Would you take a taser? If help were miles and miles and valuable minutes away, what would you do? Let's talk about it in the comments.